Good afternoon, everyone. It's Amanda with the Content Marketing Institute. Welcome back to our Monday live stream. As you know, you can find us here pretty much every Monday at noon Eastern here in the U.S. And today we have something a little special for all of you. Instead of the Ask the CM World community live stream we usually have, we have a live presentation of Marketing Makers with CMI's very own Robert Rose. Hello, Robert. <laughs> Hello, hello. It's really, uh, it's really fun to be here, and I'm, you know, ex excited to try this out. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be an interesting experiment. See if we can pull this off. <laughs> well, with you, um, I'm sure it will be fabulous. What are you talking about today? Well, we're going to talk. I thought, so you know, it, the theme for this month, uh, before we even decided to do this live, was uh, visual storytelling. So. Uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about how we see the world of visual storytelling uh, evolving and and some best practices because you know it's it's one visual storytelling we find is one of those things where everybody kind of goes yeah I got it but it's like do we do we do we really <laughs> do, do we really have it um, so yeah it'll be it'll be a fun little quick ex exploration and then have some conversation on the backside of things. All right. So as always with our live streams, if you have a question or a comment for Robert, feel free to drop it in the comment section. And as he said, we will hopefully have a little conversation um, at the end of the show. All right, Robert, let's take it away. Let's do it. Well, hi, <laughs> and welcome. Um, so we're trying this out, right? This is a special episode of Marketing Makers. And as Amanda just said, yeah, you know, please put some comments and or uh, questions into the wonderful chat. Um, I can't promise you that I'll be looking at them while I do this. I want to try and stick to time here since this is the first time we're trying to do it. But we'll have plenty of time on the backside of things to have a little conversation. Um, and it's really great to be here with you. Um, and I thought this would be a really cool way to do visual storytelling, which would be on a live video. Um, now, the first thing I absolutely need to do is thank our sponsor. Um, this month on Marketing Makers uh, is the wonderful Vidyard. Um, and uh, Vidyard is just a great sponsor. And I really appreciate them sort of stepping up here and, and, and taking a sponsorship of Marketing Makers this month. And, you know, understanding marketing video performance, well, it can be a little like looking for a needle in a haystack. And Vidyard's online video marketing platform, it's a magnet, you know, a magnet for your needle. Host all your videos in Vidyard to measure their impact through video analytics, lead scoring, integrate them, quite frankly, into all the things that you're doing, whether that's email, content, digital marketing strategies, helping to boost your brand awareness and lead generation efforts. Get ahead of the competition by integrating video throughout the entire funnel, the entire funnel, the whole funnel, every bit of the funnel, hashtag all the things. Not only can video help you drive your pipeline, but it can help you drive stronger relationships with your customers. You can get started for free today at vidyard.com slash marketing. And I just want to thank all the really good folks there um, for uh, sponsoring today. And so, well, let's get on with it. Let's get into some of these best practices and talk about the idea of visual storytelling and how we actually get to this idea of better visual storytelling. The first thing I think we have to do here is actually do something a little different and ask ourselves, well, why are we calling it visual storytelling? And why are we calling this thing out? Because, you know, isn't this something that we would do? I mean, if we were trying to explain the idea of visual storytelling outside the confines of brands and products and service marketers, us, like what we do for a living, and say into a community of painters or sculptors or theater producers or movie, television directors, writers, music, all that stuff, we'd all kind of go, yeah, we got it. Visual storytelling. You get what, you know, why do you need to explain that? And isn't it kind of like saying, you know, we need a separate defined approach for tasty food versus any other kind of food? I mean, I don't know anybody who goes, nah, I don't like visuals or 
I, I really hate storytelling. I hate stories. I mean, we're hardwired for both of these things, right? You're, you know, and look, there's been innumerable studies and any visual storytelling sort of workshop or presentation you've seen has talked about the idea of how powerful storytelling is on its power for learning. And, you know, one study that is often found that visual aids improve learning by 400% and that visual content is processed 60,000 times faster than the brain than, than text alone. And yeah, we've heard that before. We know that that's a big, important thing. So what is it we're really talking about here? Well, in business, this is what we find anyway in all of the work that we do. So visual storytelling is quite frankly, a practice that's less common and lags behind a lot of the things that we do when we create communication. So unlike artists and theater companies and movie studios and comic book publishers and all these sort of people that we would expect to normally create visual storytelling. Historically, we in marketing, we in sales, we in communications and business, we communicate in words, linear words. Now, sometimes those words are accompanied by pictures, but it's the words that are important typically in marketing. And the words, maybe they tee up some sort of brand or sales or product metaphor. Here's a great example of that basically saying, you know, a particular kind of stone is representative of a long relationship and it becomes sort of a metaphor for what our relationship can be and drives the sales of the particular product. Or in many cases, you know, the words are sort of literal explanations, claims, features, benefits, all those kinds of things. Even if it's really visual, it might be, you know, really clever, right, in terms of the marketing copy. But we should distinguish what we're looking at here from the idea of visual storytelling. And why? Well, because these days, all those words that we create, the things that we create, the marketing communications that we create, they're contained in all kinds of things, right? PowerPoints, PDFs, printed letters, magazines, blogs, billboards, websites. So even when we use imagery, we as marketers aren't often telling those stories through the use of those images. We're looking at simply creating attention or evoking some sort of quick emotion to drive an action towards something. So even when those images are there, they're just simply meant to complement or convey specific words, grab your attention. The difference is literally in the phrase itself. It is visual storytelling, right? Meaning that unless we're actually telling a story, the visual part doesn't matter. So the question is, how are you telling that story? How? And in this case, and it might seem kind of duh at this point, but it's visually, right? We use mediums like graphics, still moving pictures, drawings, physical events, and yes, even words to tell a story. But the visual is the important part. But wait a minute. Hold on a second. How is that different than simply using an image in an ad? Well, aren't we using that image to relay that message? Well, yeah, you are. But in that case, you're visually advertising or more broadly, you might be visually communicating. Visual storytelling is different because as we've taught a lot in our content marketing story class, a story is a very specific thing. When you look at it defined, when we look at storytelling, we see it's an account of real people and events told for entertainment. But even more specifically, and as we talk a lot about in our work, stories have structure. They are recognized by that structure. They have beginnings, middles, and ends. They are about people. They have tension, conflict. They have uh, humanistic souls. They argue for a theme or a moral or a point by adhering to the structures that we have become so familiar with. They're a recognized format of communication. So for example, what's typically not a story? Well, tons of things that are communication are not stories, manifestos and claims and lists and data and information, contracts, recipes, instructions, slogans, calls to actions, logos, on and on and on and on. So for example, if we think about a story told in one picture, well, this is not a story told in one picture. Now it's cute, it's wonderful, it's very clever, but it's not a story. But this on the other hand, well, this is a story told in one picture. 
your brain can start to see and connect the dots, the beginning, the middle, and end of that story. There's tension there. There's a moral of some kind. It's got most of the ingredients a great story would want to tell, and it's done so visually in one picture. So if I picture a full page ad or an image or a TV commercial or a metaphor for my product with a headline or a claim or a slogan and some copy that lists the features and benefits, I am not visually storytelling. I might have some of the most beautiful images in the world, but if it's simply a series of images that are meant to make some claim about how awesome my brand is or awesome my product is, I'm not storytelling. Again, it might be visual, but it's not visual storytelling. Now, you might be saying, but Robert, isn't that line blurry? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely blurry. There's also a, a wonderful amount of subjectivity to this. Nike, for example, does an amazing job of really focusing on telling great stories in their advertising, arguable or not, that they are visual stories or visual storytelling in the way that they create some of their marketing materials. There are many, many, many types of storytelling forms that do exist. Autobiographies, the epic, a fable, fantasy, folk tales, myths, novels, plays, poems, screenplays, tall tales, all that stuff, comic books, memoirs, fiction, you know, nonfiction, on and on and on. They follow that structure. So it's inherently interpretive and its structure and its beauty can be really subtle. So it's storytelling if we as the audience can appreciate the story behind it and connect it and it's visual if it's done so in a visual way. So if we're going to dive into visual storytelling, we need to think of ourselves first as storytellers, utilizing the visual medium as the way or the part of how, the narrative of how we will tell a specific story. So as the Mandalorian might say, well, this is the way. Now you see, for some of you there, there's a deeper meaning in what I did. You understand in a different kind of way. Others of you who aren't familiar, you might understand the words and get the gist of it, but not appreciate the full context of that. It may have can even confused some of you. This is the heart and the science of visual storytelling. As a storyteller first, you have a specific and shared meaning that you want to communicate, but your choices about which visuals that you will utilize to communicate that meaning might be purposely contextualized for a very specific tone, or in this case, an inside kind of geek baseball knowledge, or even poetry in some cases. You are choosing visuals to be the metaphors or the context for the beginnings, middles, and ends of the stories you're looking to create. And this is the real key, the skill, the best practice of what we work a lot with with clients and the attendees to our workshops is that understanding the visual is a type of narrative. It is how we make our stories more powerful. So when we think of those two things, if a story is dictionary defined as imaginary or real people and events told for entertainment, well, then the narrative is the choice of which events to relate and in order and in what form. So visual storytelling is then simply a choice to tell a story that we want to tell in a different way, in a different form. And in this case, it's visual. Okay. So at this point, you're saying, that's entertaining, and that's interesting, and but my point is still valid. Why does any of that matter? I mean, isn't it all just semantics at the end of the day? How does this help me get better at my craft, the art and science of that stuff? Well, let's see if we can take a look at that. Because we know that digital is moving at ever-increasing speeds. I mean, I don't need to tell any of you that. That's happening more and more and more and more. I don't have to throw stats at you. Just, you know, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, uh, Facebook Pinterest, YouTube, you get it. But this, of course, means that we as marketers, as content creators, well, we're being led into a much more visual medium. And as a result, need to evolve our skills to develop more meaningful visual experiences for our audiences. We have to match what's going on out there in the world. But interestingly, and this is really just fascinating to me, there's also another trend here. And this is something where we're seeing the people who can start to develop and tell a great visual stories to be able to pull that context out, to poetically move those things, those visuals into those interesting contexts will have a distinct advantage as marketers. Because it's not just the increased bandwidth and ease of pictures and production and video that have been able to give us this ability. It's also 
our entire language, the human language, the, our means of communicating with each other is also becoming more visual. The internet and digital technology has fundamentally shifted the way we use language and even the words that we use. We now use acronyms as well as little small icons, these emojis in order to add context or a narrative to our conversations. So for example, I might say something to a friend such as, you need to see this. And then I would add a small little emoji after the end of it that immediately lives, gives her an visual cue that what I need her to see is not something bad or I'm not angry about it. So it sets an expectation, it sets a context. In many cases, we become so attuned to these symbols, you don't even read the acronyms or the icons anymore. They're simply there to visually provide a context for the emotion or tone. We can have complete conversations with emojis now. I mean, there's like this one, which might be, you know, a little hard for us to decipher without knowing the backstory here. But for those in the story, they have a whole deep context here. Basically, if we look at the translation of this context, it's an entire conversation had in images. Further, it's now common to not only make a joke with one of the millions of internet memes out there, the pictures, the photos, those things from popular culture that are starting to become representations of our language. Well, some of them have quite frankly become part of our economy. This is a photo that quite frankly has been the inspiration for creating a whole currency I mean, that's amazing when you start to think about it. But it's also now not uncommon to have complete conversations themselves with people using only these memes and pictures. So for example, you can totally imagine this conversation taking place in text or email or you know, some sort of you know, uh, in back and forth on a website. Somebody might say, so this just happened. And then they have the picture of the distracted boyfriend there. And the response from the friend is, the confused fry with the not sure if flirting or just nice and maybe saying, maybe it's that. And in response, the friend comes back with, I'm sure it's just fine. But of course, with the it's just fine me, meaning it's not fine at all. It's absolutely not fine at all. And so ultimately, as marketers, as content practitioners, as storytellers, we have to get better skilled at visual communications. It is going to become so much more of what we do. And becoming attuned to visual storytelling will really help us do that. And the reason that understanding that visual is the narrative to complement our story is that it helps us define what it is we're going to do when we tell that story, what provides the context, no matter how we actually visually contain, uh, convey that context. In other words, what I mean by that is visual storytelling doesn't mean that we don't use words or scripts or copy but it changes the way that we tell our story so that we deliver it visually using pictures, moving pictures, graphics, and yes, even words sometimes, not as a means of describing the story, but as a visual representation of the story. So quickly before we finish up here, so what are some of the best practices of this? What are we, how can we incorporate this into our content marketing and our creation of it better? So now this is the part where we might expect to go into the well-worn list that basically describes what great storytelling is. And there's no shortage of these lists around. And please go take a look. There's some wonderful work being done all over the internet in terms of getting to be better storytellers. You know, show, don't tell, be personal, true, authentic, show conflict, or have some kind of conflict, or focus, make sure that you're not getting lost in all the details, teach something, don't be obvious, you know, for the keys, you know, know your audience, know what they want, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are well-worn places that we see storytelling happening and they're all good and extremely important. But what I wanted to do in this little short time in this episode of Marketing Makers is basically bring you something around that narrative, around the idea of visual storytelling. And that's the context. That's the narrative that we're hoping to develop our skill here for. If, if you're interested in CMI's masterclass, it has an entire section on narrative and storytelling where we talk about all these things um, and really getting to a finer point on them. But here's a couple of things that we find that are really good when we start thinking about visual storytelling. One is archetypes. Stereotypes and recognized symbolism are your friends. Now, I know that sounds weird, right? Because we're always trying to stay away from stereotypes and cliches. 
But when we're creating a visual story, we want to cr quickly create that impression in someone's mind, the audience's mind. So when we want to create emotional metaphors that are easily and most widely understood, we want to get there as quickly as we possibly can. And great archetypes are a great way to do that. Now, there may be reasons and choices that we make for not doing that. But most of the time when we need to quickly convey something emotional or quick, we want to get to the archetype. So for example, if I want to tell the story of a doctor, well, we want to set the scene very, using a very recognizable doctor. Like in a novel or a short story, you could spend three pages explaining the thoughts and the feelings inside the doctor's head and how she's internally processing the channels or the challenges of the pressures of treating sick children, et cetera, and let the audience discover slowly over time that she's a doctor. And of course, you can do that over three or four pages. But if you're visually storytelling, it's important to know she's a doctor right away. You need to open with that visual clue, the archetypal clue that she's a doctor. And even though most doctors don't walk around with stethoscopes around their neck, that plus the white coat says you doctor right away. Here's another example. If I'm trying to be funny and I want to put out something that says in one picture, Here's what my friend and my family and the world thinks I do for a living against who I think I am, right? Now, these are funny because they're instantly recognizable stereotypes or archetypes from pop culture. So from my mom thinks that I make coupons to my boss thinks I'm an idiot to I think I'm the next Steve Jobs, this is funny because we recognize it quickly. If I want you to have a mental picture and understanding of who I am, I can explain it or I can provide you with an image. And when I want to do it quickly, archetypes or sometimes even stereotypes or symbolism can be your friend. You can quickly get to your point using an image that your audience understands immediately. Also, it's the way to establish tone or expectations about whether you're about to laugh or cry or expect drama or comedy. You can get to different tones with these archetypes as well. This is why casting is such an important part of movies. Right. If I get cast and I see Ryan Reynolds is in a movie versus if I see someone else is in a movie, I'm going to think something different about that movie when I think about who's in it. So as an example, if I show you these two things, the words are exactly the same, but it's really different when Nick Cage says it versus when Willy Wonka says the same exact thing. The tone is different. The context is different. This is how you, visual becomes a tool for us to set emotion and tone and context for how we want the audience to react. You immediately sense that different tone between the two, even though the words can be exactly the same. Using iconic archetypes or sometimes stereotypes or symbolism can help you visually represent your story quickly. That brings us to two, letting your audience fill in the blanks. So audiences are very creative. And if you allow them to be, and honestly, they will enjoy it more if they do. Pixar writer Andrew Stanton wrote about this um, in his TED Talk where he talks and says, the audience wants to work to discover meaning, but they don't want to work that hard. In other words, they want to, don't want to be aware that they're working. They want to fill in the blanks, but they wanted you to do it elegantly so that they're not even aware that they're working. Great television and movie directors do this all the time. We can see this, right? So for example, let's say um, let's say the mom says to the dad, you know, it's the day after Thanksgiving. Let's go shopping. And they grab their car keys and they run out the door. And then all of a sudden you cut to the Quentin Tarantino slow move, walking down the street in slow motions. And then they got swords and chainsaws in their hand as if they're going to fight the zombie apocalypse. That's funny because we laugh because we know they're not going to fight the zombie apocalypse. They're going to prepare for Black Friday shopping at the mall. When you're visually storytelling, we can figure out what the important images are so that you don't have to explain everything. Use that visualization to set that idea and get to what it is we want to say easily. And that brings us to the last that I'll cover for this episode anyway, which is it doesn't have to be linear. We don't have to use the same linear structures as we often do with words. Remember, this is your narrative, the way you are going to tell a particular story. Reassemble or assemble the events and images and pictures in the order that tells the most powerful story, not necessarily what happened in exactly what order. A great example of this in business is the customer story. 
you don't have to explain it every single event of the customer story and how they used your product, nor do you have to do it in the exact order that it happened. Make it work for the story that you want to tell. Don't lie, obviously, but tell it in a way that restructures it to make the story more powerful. And you don't have to include every event. Omit events if they don't serve your story. And you don't have to tell me that this is not okay because you all do it. We all do it, right? <laughs> I will tell you the story of your first date. Think about that for a moment. When you've either had or if you have currently a significant other in your life, and you know which first date I'm talking, you know which first date I'm talking about, that first date, right? And your significant other, the way you relay that story to, oh, let's say your mom versus the way that you tell it to your best friend, let's just say things get omitted and things get reordered in a different way. Visual stories can really omit and shape unneeded events. Great example of this is Forrest Gump and the novel versus the movie. For those of you that read the novel, you know the novel ends with Forrest starting up his shrimp business in memory of his friend Bubba, which would just seem weird in the movie version where Forrest ends up where he does. They chose to reorder those events to make them more powerful. Ultimately, the strength of visual storytelling is because our brains can process faster. Like we talked about in the beginning, we as audience can react to them more quickly. Use that. Use that as storytellers to operate in a much different way. And if we can start creating the different kinds of meaning that comes through that powerful way for differentiation, boy, that can help us get out of that sea of sameness that we're in and the way that we talk about our products and the way that we talk about our brand, the way that we talk about our industry, all the things that we need to do. You know, in the end, of course, it's all a mix. Visuals, audio, words, speech. Our job as content creators is to mix it all up into some wonderful, delicious soup. And so just like our style of editorial, just like our style of music or our style of logo or our style of brand tone, we can develop our own style of visual storytelling, how we want to tell it. You know a Steven Spielberg movie when you see a Steven Spielberg movie because there's a style, there's a style there that you can start to develop on your own. We've been doing it since the dawn of people, scrawling on walls, relaying our metaphors, our thoughts and emotions. You know, there's this, um, there's this writer's trope that, uh, I don't know whether it was Ben Franklin or Thoreau or John Adams or whoever, whoever it's attributed to that says, basically, if I had more time, I'd written a shorter letter. And the idea, of course, being that, you know, simplify and it's really hard to shorten our ideas to a concise message rather than to over explain or be verbose about them. And I can tell you as a writer, I struggle with this all the time. And thankfully at CMI, I've got great editors who help me through that. But I think the same is true about visual storytelling. It's so easy to get wrapped up in directly translating the words that we want into just pictures that we start to write everything down and create all these pictures. But in the end, it might just be one perfect picture that can tell the entire story. Taking the time to get the visual story right is really well worth it. And so, yeah, we've got time for some questions and some conversation, and it's totally your story to tell. Tell it well and tell it visually. And Amanda, let's uh, let's have a little chat. Let's see what's going on with the with everybody else that's uh, been right. tuned in here. Great presentation, Robert. I was taking my um, notes here uh, while you were going along. So I think that what I took away was good editing, which you mentioned there at the end, like with yeah. any, any content you're putting out there, right? Good. Yeah. You have to edit it. Right. So, you know, you put it all together, have some, a couple people look at it and does this make sense? Are you telling yeah. a story? Or, or at least one really smart person. Yes. Right. As in my case. Yes. Yeah. So I, I love that. Know your audience, right. Which um, I have a couple questions about that, you know, and that goes, I think, along with tone, right? Know, know your audience. And so you're not putting something out there that may offend them. <laughs> yeah, there's that for sure. Exactly. Um, and then keep it simple sometimes. I love that message too. Like, oh, okay, we have to create all these visual, you know, images to go with our story or whatever, but sometimes it, it can just be something super simple. Yeah. Well, you know, it was, it was, it was something that I learned really early on when I was trying to write screenplays. And what I learned from 
you know, how collaborative a process making a movie is, is that the, the, the thing that we have to remember is that the screenplay is not the movie and the movie is the movie. And, 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 and what a director told me one time, which I think is just, was just valuable advice is the screenplay serves as a blueprint, right? And it, mm -hmm. but it is the way that the choices that are made within the, the absolute creative and collaborative process that is putting the visuals together that can change everything around a screenplay mm -hmm. to, well, it can make it better or it can completely ruin it, right? And so it's not that it, you know, it, it's just different. It's just different, you know, because it's easy for us to fall into the trap of if we say, want to write some visual story and we say, hey, let's just, you know, here's the words, here's the script that I wrote and just basically picture, 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 picture. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, that you, it's a different medium. It's a different way of thinking and putting those things together in a way that, lets us really reform and shape and twist and, and make it the story that we want to tell this way mm -hmm. is really important. And that's, it's, you know, it's a lifelong pursuit for many. And so it's, it's for us, it becomes a skill that you can apply in addition to being a great writer, mm -hmm. being a great visual storyteller is something else we can add to our little bag of tricks. That's a good example. I know when, um, I was in TV journalism, uh, a great professor once said, you know, show it, don't tell it. So right. sometimes I think that you get, you know, mixed up and just like you said, the words are coming out, but how can you take those words and show it instead of just telling them the information, give it to them in a visual way? Yeah. Yeah. I was just watching, I, I was just on an airplane uh, and it, I don't know, just this, just literally at the top of mind as you, as you said that I was watching that movie free guy. Have you, this is a speaking no, of I want to see Reynolds, it right? because I'm a Ryan Reynolds fan. So yeah, <laughs> I so seen this, I, I'm watching this movie and I literally turned it off 15 minutes into it because it, it was the scene when he goes and, and that, you know, Ryan Reynolds is certainly sort of a, almost an ancillary character in this movie. It's really about this other, you know, game developer and the game developer and, and his ex-girlfriend are having an argument and they're literally spending the argument, just the exposition is just coming out of them. Well, 15 years ago when you broke up with me and this is the reason you broke up with me because we had a fight about this thing, you know, and it's like, this, it's just like, oh my gosh, this, this is just, this is awful. This is just really yes. awful. And that's the risk we run. Well, now I'm sad because I really wanted to see that movie, Robert. And now yeah, I may have, I, you know, I didn't ruin it. So <laughs> no, but now I'm making you want to see it less. <laughs> I just couldn't, I, I couldn't, I, as the dude says, I can't abide. I just, I, I could not abide. <laughs> Even yeah. with Ryan Reynolds? No. Um, yeah, I, you know, I mean, he was funny in it, but the, the writing and the movie making was awful. Oh, no. All right, let me jump into some questions we have here. Um, I hope I say your name wrong, right. Hamid says, sometimes it's hard to transfer your meaning via pictures. What should we do? Yes, it is very hard sometimes. It is very, very hard sometimes. And the, you know, and it's and it's one of those things where, I mean, just speaking about this movie we were talking about, you know, it can be, you know, how do you actually transform your the communication the words that you're trying to uh say into a visual and sometimes quite frankly it is uh you know it, it is impossible to do or it is so difficult that it's not worth doing in other words <laughs> there you know there's a there's a, a funny sort of i guess it's a trope at this point in 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 hollywood which says you know, some, some stories, some novels are just unfilmable, right? It's just, you know, you can't actually, you know, they're so in, the, you know, the character's minds or the comp, you know, the things are so complex that it becomes really, really difficult to make visuals out of them. I was just, um, uh, you know, reading a critique of the new Cowboy Bebop, which is really taking to task the live action nature of it versus the animated nature of it saying, basically you don't get the same meaning. And so it can be really, really difficult. Some ideas just don't translate to visual storytelling as well. And so, 
the, you know, yes, it can be extraordinarily difficult, but it doesn't always mean that it, you have to do it. Right. And so mm -hmm. when we, when we have to do it, you have to find some way to try and leverage what those, that meaning that story is and try and communicate it in a visual way. But sometimes it's just good enough to say, you know what, this doesn't lend itself that well to visual, you know, to a visual thing and either come up with a different idea or come up with a different way of doing it. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's audio, maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it is the written word. Maybe it is, that is the best medium for it. Yeah, that's good. You, you just like, if you're forcing it, then it's not going to be good. Right. <laughs> exactly. You know, and you know, so, I mean, sometimes you have to force it because it has to be something visual, but if it's not working for you and it's really difficult mm -hmm. and you're finding it really challenging, you kind of have to ask yourself at some point, is this the best medium for this idea? Right. Mm -hmm. Is it, you know, it, you know, radio shows, for example, really don't translate that well to a visual medium. And so it's really hard to make them interesting. All right, here's another uh, question for you. Tamara says, what about stereotyping, perpetuating biases? What is totally. a good rule of thumb? Yeah, absolutely, yes. And I mean, as we've seen in the last, um, in, in the last, 24 months, 36 months, years, really, you know, you can make bad choices. You can definitely make bad choices around creating visual archetypes that are perpetuating stereotypes, et cetera. And as storytellers, it is up to us to be conscious of where we are in, you know, in our current, um, in the current culture to understand what works, what doesn't, and what is, you know, in some cases, you, what you, what I find anyway, is that those perpetuations are sort of easy way out. In other words, they're so cliched that they, that at this point it's like, well, that was, you know, it goes back to our question of having it be really difficult to do. Sometimes you have to sort of go beyond the first answer or the second answer that immediately comes to your mind because it might perpetuate a stereotype or it might perpetuate uh, a myth or it might perpetuate something that is not culturally acceptable. And that is the difference between making really smart choices with visual storytelling versus making really um, interesting or, you know, not as, you know, basically furthering the, 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 you know, furthering the, the, the skill, furthering the, the art, furthering the, you know, taking it to another level. I, you know, for example, I love how, movies, there's a, there's a number of movies that are coming out that are completely just, you know, looking at turning, turning on, on their, their head, head, the idea of what a Western is, or what even a movie about the Renaissance in Europe is, and what, you know, what these things are, because quite frankly, it doesn't matter. We can move forward. We can visually tell a story that's much more interesting by not, you know, perpetuating some stereotype, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it's great. a great, it's a great cautionary tip, right? Yep. It's like, you know, you just have to be careful. And so archetypes, yes. Symbolism, yes. Get to something that the audience understands. Um, you know, so in that Renaissance movie, in that Western, they're all wearing cowboy hats and, and six shooters and, or they're, you know, they're wearing the right, you know, the appropriate outfits, but maybe they look very different than, than we are used to seeing in, in those kinds of things. That's the part of the creative expression that I think is so, so really wonderful and rich. Great, great stuff here. Great questions from everyone. And Joshua notes that he thinks Red Notice is perhaps a better Ryan Reynolds movie. So I'll be checking that one out as well. There you go. There you go. <laughs> all right, Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank as you always, all. these live streams are brought to you by CMI, Content Marketing Institute, the leading training and education uh, organization for all things content marketing. You can find out more at contentmarketinginstitute.com, where you can also find past episodes of Marketing Makers, because Robert has been doing the, these for quite a while. So um, you can go to shows and you will find um, his past episodes there as well. And we will be back here. I will be back here. Robert won't be back here. I will be back here um, next Monday. We're taking a break for the Thanksgiving holiday here in the U.S., but we will be back with our Ask the CM World Community live stream on Monday, November 29th. Until then, be well, everyone. Be well, Robert. 
Um, have Absolutely. A good and if you dig week. this, let us know. Let us know yes. if you like this so that we know whether we should do it again or not. Absolutely. Leave us a little um, notes in the comments or message us. We'd love to hear that. So, all right, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Have a good week. Thank you.